Do Re Utre. <laughs> and thank you very much for that very kind introduction, Anna. And I want to bring you greetings from Tennessee in the USA, where the daffodils are in full bloom. And this is from my, my garden there. It says Illinois State University, and that is my institution, but I retired in 2010, retired in inverted commas, <laughs> and I have been living in Knoxville, Tennessee since 2010. Now, I was very happy yesterday that Dor, in his presentation, brought out the idea of metaphor, because this has been very, very important in my research on visualization. And I wanted to bring you these flowers as a metaphor. And I want you to remember these flowers. They are the metaphor for the flowering of the friendships and the collaborations that you form here in this important venue. And I want you to bring those collaborations and the results of your research and your connections into the international PME community, where we can all benefit from this conference, which is a very important one. Now, I if I had realized that I would be giving my talk on the last day instead of the first, I would have written a very different talk. So I want to give a few thank yous before I start my official presentation. And above all, I want to, well, I want to say thank you to Yandex for the very generous support that they have given. And when I especially felt very ill on Monday, there were people through the week who have helped me and have made it possible for me to stand here today. So I want to thank Alexandra particularly. L please give her a hand because she... Her work to help me through this has been really appreciated, as well as the help and the concern of my friends. So thank you all for being so understanding. And I would also thank Steve Lerman if he were still here, but in his absence, he stepped in as the first plenary speaker at a moment's notice. So, having said all that, this is not the talk that I would have given on this day, but I will stick to my script, and uh, not to make it too complicated, but I will slightly emphasize different aspects than I would have emphasized on the first day in the introduction. So, um, yes, I, I've asked, Anna, is it necessary? Let us ask them. Uh, I asked Anna if she would stand by to translate the metaphor. Is it necessary? No, you all understand the metaphor, all right. I do not need Anna to translate. Thank you. So, officially, here is the plan of my presentation. I want to start with the differences between research in pure mathematics and in mathematics education. And this is a very foundational idea. But I think it is still necessary, and I will explain why in a moment. Then I will talk uh, briefly about the establishment of mathematics education research as a field in its own right. As you know, mathematics is thousands of years old. As a research field, mathematics education is a baby. It is new. Maybe one century or 50 years, depending how you look on it. But it is a growing field, and it is important that we understand it as a field in its own right. And this includes the history of PME. And I particularly want to emphasize the PME aspect in my talk, because this has been a very special conference for me, PME. My first PME was PME number four in Berkeley, California, in 1980. And 
So I have seen it grow through the decades and seen the changes. And it's quickly became my favorite conference. I think it has had a tremendous impact in the world. And I look forward to having all of you join this community if you are not already part of it. We need Russia in this community, and it has been underrepresented. So I will talk about the evolution, both in theory and empirically, of quantitative and qualitative research and the different purposes that those fulfill. And then finally, there have been others at this conference who have been experts in Vygotsky or Davidov. But I think a person who has been very important, especially in my work, and who has not received the recognition that he deserves, is Krutetsky. So I will highlight his theoretical aspects. And then I will give some indications of his influence in my research on visualization. And this research was done at the high school level, but since then, in the decades since, it has spread to undergraduate and many different areas, including the metaphors. I was very excited at Do's presentation when he mentioned the metaphors. So, uh, let me go straight to my diagram here, because if I were Dor, I would probably do this. You can see it is a Venn diagram. And he would have done it with one circle at a time and introduced these things. I have done it as a, a global concrete image, but I hope that you can see it holistically. And I want to just give a little background to this. The diagram comes from the conference in honor of Ted Eisenberg on his retire retirement in Israel. And Ted Eisenberg and I have been friends for a long time. But Ted was upset when I said that I felt that I was coming home to mathematics education research. The, the background to this is, in the 1990s, I wrote a paper for the conference in College Park, Maryland, in the USA. What is research in mathematics education, and what are its results? And my paper was called Mathematics Education Research Embracing Arts and Sciences. And I looked on, on it as a, a complex human world. And, well, my background is that I started out to become a nuclear physicist in the hard sciences. And I soon realized there was too much of the arts in me. I love music, I love poetry. And I realized I would not be happy in the, the hard sciences of nuclear physics. And that's when I became a teacher. But in this research in mathematics education, I felt I was coming home because it is still rigorous. Whether we do statistical research or qualitative interviews or other kinds of research. And therefore, it is very necessary to be clear how the mathema mathematician's research fits together with the research that we are doing. Because often, the mathematicians and the mathematics education researchers are talking past each other. So, if you can see, uh, I hope the words are clear enough there, the mathematics is the red dot in the center, and it's central to everything. When mathematicians do research, they're doing it on the subject of mathematics. However, it's also part of the teaching, and mathematicians teach mathematics. So therefore, the mathematicians would be doing not only the research on the mathematics itself, but they would be teaching. 
so the mathematics education is in their domain. Yes. I would uh, be really grateful if we postpone the question time a bit because I think that, I mean, that's wonderful to yes. make it as a discussion later. Yeah. Okay. No, but this Thank is a you. clarification and I can s quickly tell. Okay. Um, when I say mathematics here, I'm thinking in general. It might be the, the research mathematicians' cutting edge, state-of-the-art mathematics that they are working on. Or it could be m simple mathematics whether in the education, or the point is that the mathematics is the center of everything in both the mathematician's work and in the educator's work. However, look at the bigger part of the Venn diagram, mathematics education research. This is not a branch of applied mathematics, as Ted Eisenberg suggested, because applied mathematics would mean that we are taking the principles of mathematics and we are applying them to our research, and that is not the case. It's not applied mathematics. The topic of our research in mathematics education research is mathematics education. The subset, and mathematics itself is the subset of that. So I hope the difference here is clear. And there can be mutual harmony. Um, mathematics education researchers can be pure mathematicians too, if they are doing research in pure mathematics. Anyway, I have to press on. I'm going to skip a lot in this talk because it was geared as an introduction on the first day and I don't have to talk about everything here. I have already explained this. Let me pass to the evolution of research in mathematics education. And I think we can trace the evolution of our field of research back to 1908, where in Rome, there was the founding of the organization called ICBI, International Congress on Mathematics Instruction. And we had a, a centenary of this in the year 2008. And I was privileged to be there in the very room where this organi organization started. And since then, research in mathematics education has moved from a paradigm where we were trying to be scientific. It was quantitative and only rigorous statistical methodologies were considered scientific. Then there were decades of development of quality control in qualitative methodologies. And it's not that these are less rigorous. This is something we had to learn. The qualitative research is just as rigorous, but it has a different purpose. And now, through the evolution of the decades, we have come to realize that the purpose of the statistical work is a more general one. It's to see how widespread some phenomenon is. And in my own research, it was the qualitative part of it. I did both in my research. And the depth of understanding came from the qualitative part, the interviews with the students, trying to enter into the the cognitive aspects and understand how they were understanding. So uh, how then can we have the rigor in the qualitative methodologies, which are squarely in the, the other part of the diagram that might be concerned with psychology, anthropology, philosophy, anything that deals with the complex human worlds of human beings in their learning. So certainly, this, the numerical methods are important, but for the depth of understanding human learning, we also need the arts, the humanities. So what do we do? I'm going to spend a few minutes 
and that means I will skip some other parts of this talk, talking about how we can make the qualitative research rigorous. And for many of you, you know this already, so if you're familiar with what we do, please just hold, bear with me for a moment. And I will also illustrate it in my own research. But it's not just that we, we try to make an opinion. Opinion is not research. And therefore, there are methods that we use in order to test. We use triangulation. And triangulation could be of different kinds. It could be that you collect data from three different sources. As a surveyor uses triangulation to home in on a particular point in the survey, so there might be interviews, there might be observations in classroom, and there might be the documents that the children are writing. And if all these three data sources are giving you the same impression or information, then it gives you a pretty good idea that this is more than just opinion. There is something here. But there are other ways that you too, you can check the, the data. And now we are very aware that we need to do, when, when we transcribe an interview, and those of you who've done it know how time consuming it is, 10 minutes might take more than an hour to transcribe. But then, if we can go back to the person whose words we are transcribing and say, is this what you said? Is this what you meant? Then this is called respondent validation. And it becomes part of the data. And in this way, there's some feedback that it is not just our opinion or we have made mistakes and are we calling it fact. And so, uh, the mixed methods now are the way that we see that these two parts, the qualitative and the quantitative, are really two sides of the same coin with different purposes. And they could come in either order. Angelica here, I had a nice book with Angelica all about qualitative methodologies. And there, there's a very good chapter on mixed methods, and it points out that there are different ways of doing it, either the qualitative first and then the quantitative, or the other way around. However, I don't want to spend too long on this, because I'm not going to finish if I don't hurry a bit. So let me just talk about PME for a moment. And, and as I said, I started going to PME in 1980, PME 4, but it started in Karlsruhe in 1976 and was founded by three great scholars in our field, Hans Freudenthal and uh, Richard Skemp and Fischbein. And the, the whole idea of PME was to bring together people who were interested in the learning of mathematics through the psychology. And it has grown tremendously, but you can see it started in Utrecht in 1977 with 86 participants. In Vancouver, Canada in 2014, there were 865. And this has been a tremendous influence in our field. And it soon became my favorite conference because the friendships that you form and the the lasting collaborations go from year to year in a, a way that is continuous, and we learn from each other. And not only that, if you want to publish an article in a journal, it might take more than a year, but the proceedings of PME are available at the conference. And six months before that, you have written your paper, and it's a rather quick turnaround in the scheme of things. Your research is disseminated. And in this way, we learn from each other and we work together. So I'm not going to spend time on that. Let me move to Krutetsky. Oh, 
wait a moment. Yeah. So the reason that I want to talk about Krutetsky is not because he was, not only because he was very influential in my research, but because he was way ahead of his time. He worked in the Soviet Union, and uh, his, his graduation was in 1941 with a degree in economic geography from Moscow State University. His PhD in 1950 from the USSR Academy of Pedagogical Sciences. And he was there for nearly 30 years. Deputy Director of the Research Institute of General and Educational Psychology. Now, we, we became, it became known to English speakers in 1963, briefly, when he delivered a paper in, in Washington, D.C., at the 17th International Congress on Psychology. And four of his papers were translated in 1969. However, it was the translation of his 1968 book, into English in 1976 called The Psychology of Mathematical Abilities in School Children that caused the editors, who were Jeremy Kilpatrick and Itzhak Wurzup, to consider that the potential impact of this work was as great as that of Piaget. Now, it has not happened. And I think he has been undervalued because his work was rigorous at that time in the history, but a lot of his work and the insights that he drew from his research were qualitative in an, an era when only quantitative research was being valued in the Western world. So, in describing some of his work, he was very interested in the differences in thinking of children as they were of all levels, small children up to teenagers. And what was it that made children think differently when they were doing the same problems with the same teacher? This was not a popular topic in the Soviet era. Testing in schools was discontinued in 1936, although psychologists still did tests. But he defined ability as a personal trait that enables one to perform a given task rapidly and well. And in his work, and I'll talk more about how he got these results, he identified three different types of, uh, of abilities. And the one was analytic, the logic, a predominantly verbal logical component. But there was also a geometrical one. The visual pictorial component was what he was looking at as well. And then some of his interviewees had these components in equilibrium, so he called that harmonic, but with two subsets, abstract harmonic, leaning towards the logic, and pictorial harmonic, leaning towards visualization. And he had, he, he tried to contrast what he called capable students with what he called incapable students, although he made the point that they might be gifted in other areas. But the difference between the capable and the incapable students was what gave him this, what he called the structure of mathematical abilities. And these elements here were analyzed from his research, and he had gifted students in all these categories. So, I'm not going to spend long talking about the structure that he obtained from his research, because I want to concentrate on his methodology. But it was very important that he looked at these four components, 
And what he did is he devised a series of 27 prob series of problems, 27 series, not 27 problems. And each series was looking at a particular component in the structure. And this is a rich treasure trove of mathematical problems, some of them involving words only, but some of them algebraic or other topics, at high school level or a little bit middle school level. But we have not, uh, I don't believe that we have fully used his treasure trove of problems. So I want to highlight those as well. So from this, you can see briefly that the difference between the students that he called capable and those that he called incapable was the ability for a formalized perception, grasping the formal structure of the problem. And the processing aspect, abilities for logical thought, generalization, curtailment, flexibility, clarity, logical economy and reversibility, all these were part of what he investigated. Of course, retaining mathematical information, this is important. The students who were capable did not see each problem as a new problem. They had a generalized memory for the mathematical relationships. And this will come strongly in a moment when I talk about my own research. And then finally, there was a general synthetic component, a mathematical cast of mind. Some of these students, the ones who were, well, his gifted students, were seeing the whole world through mathematical eyes. And there were some things here that were not part of the structure unexpectedly. What is missing? He noticed that what was missing here it didn't matter whether they were doing this quickly or slowly. It didn't matter whether they had outstanding computational abilities. It didn't matter very much if they could remember formulas, symbols, numbers. And unexpectedly, visualizing abstract mathematical relationships was also not essential, not obligatory. All these are optional. They determine the type of mathematical processing, not its efficacy, not how good it is. So in order to get you into some of his problems, I'm going to select just a few. And these, because this was my interest, I have chosen the ones from the, the, the type, the series that dealt with visualization. But now, I've already told you something that probably I wouldn't have told if I were doing research, because you now know I'm interested in visualization. I'm going to give you one of his problems and ask you to do this in the way that is comfortable for you. It's a simple problem, but I'll give you a few minutes just to do it. And I was excited a few days ago in talking with Professor Kap Kaplonovich. Kaplon Kaplonovich, thank you very much. Because he used this very same problem in his work. And just have a look at this one and see how you would do it and then get an answer and just hold on to the answer or you can talk to someone if you want to. A brick weighs the same as a kilogram and half a brick. How much does a brick weigh? I'll give you just a moment. All right, you got an answer? What answer did you get? Two kilograms? 
Did you all get two kilograms? All right, now here's my question. If you did this using algebra or even thinking algebra, please put up your hand. All right. Which of you had an image in your mind that enabled you to get the answer? There we are, yes. <laughs> and I could see Dor was using gestures here. And the gestures are a good indication of imagery. It was one of the biggest indicators I had in the work, my work with teachers. So, yes, uh, the visualizers. Some of them imagine it as a scale, solid, concrete imagery. There's a brick, there's a kilogram weight and half a brick. Cut this one in half, throw two halves away, what's left? A half a brick and a kilogram. So what's the weight of the brick? Double, two kilograms. Easy? Yes. And this was one of the problems that I used when I was trying to validate my preference for visualization test. But uh, let me just show you one thing. I used this in my research, and it comes directly from Krutetsky's work. So definitely, the strength of logic is important in, the, in all mathematical thinking, at all levels. And you can think of that on the x-axis. But then there is this visualization component. But it's not in opposition to the logic. It's on the y-axis, it's orthogonal to it. And you can think of the visual processing then as optional. So some people will like to use pictures, others will not, but they may get the same answer for the problems. So my work then was based on Krutetsky's formulation and it started at Cambridge University, but it expanded through the decades to include especially metaphors, metaphor and metonymy I wrote about, semiotics, and working not only at the high school level where I started, but also with undergraduates in the university. But I made a test which was not intended to measure the ability of students, but their preference for visualization. And in order to do that, I had to define what I mean by visualization. So my definition was that it includes mental visual imagery, pictures in the mind, involving visual or spatial information. And this is internal. In those days, we were talking about internal and external representations. But it also includes inscriptions of various kinds, the external representations. And in the test, it was for preference, so I could not put the word visualization into the title of the test. I called it the mathematical processing instrument. So that when people did it, they did not realize oh, this is a visualization test, I better use pictures. And it had three parts. But first of all, I had to make a problem bank. And many of the problems that I put in my problem bank came from Krutetsky's series of problems, but not all. He did not give sources for his problems. And I think some of the sources I found were where he also found his problems. Some were from a book called Moscow Puzzles. And whereas some of his, t his problems had used diagrams, none of those in my test involved diagrams. Because it had to be only words, and then the people could choose whether or not they would use a diagram. And I wanted it to be not only for students in the high school, but also for their teachers. So there were six problems. Originally, there were more, but I had to refine the test. I kicked out the problems that were all done visually or all done non-visually. The problems themselves had to be analyzed. And eventually, I landed up with 
six in part A, 12 in part B, and those were designed for the high school students, and then six more difficult ones in part C. And the teachers did part B and part C. Because I wanted to find out who were the visualizers that I could work with. And the scores from this test, I gave it two if they used a visual method, a zero if there was algebra or logic but no visual thinking, and a, a, a one if it was not clear or if they had not done the, the problem. So for parts A and B, there were 18 items, so the maximum score was 36. And I started with, the, oh, well, let me say first of all, in the quality control, I had to work out reliability and validity, and I realized that in the kinds of data I had, nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio, I certainly didn't have ratio data, I didn't have interval data. The most I could say was that I had ordinal data. So I had to use non-parametric statistics. And on the standardization of the test, I did test whether there were differences between boys and girls, because this had been a hot topic at that time. And what do you think? Do you think there was a difference? Well, there was a slight difference in favor of the boys, but it was not significant. But there was a big difference between the teachers and the students. Who do you think was more, were more visual? The students. The, that was highly significant. And, well, I started then with the teachers, and there were 13 teachers who were prepared to work with me, and they were of a range of mathematical visuality scores. Some who always like to use pictures in, the, in problem solving, as on my test, some who never did, and some in the middle. And then I chose students in their classes using my test who were visualizers. I worked with these 54 visualizers for a whole school year. I think there were about 188 transcribed interviews. I was observing in the classroom all day, interviewing the students in their breaks, spending all night transcribing all the interviews, <laughs> and working in six schools. And the, the results were rather wonderful. I wanted also to see what kind of teaching was helping these visualizers. So I had to work out what I called teaching visuality. And the literature suggested some things that would be in indicative of visual teaching. Obviously, if they use color, if they draw lines on the blackboard, gestures were a tremendous source of, of the, uh, the imagery or the visual methods. And Eventually, that also was refined according to the rigorous criteria. And in the end, there were 12 items. And the, I, I asked the teachers whether they used these 12 items and made a note. I asked their students in the interviews whether their teachers used these. And I asked myself from my observation whether I saw the teacher using these. So here was my triangulation. And if two of the three were observed, I said, yes, the teacher does that. And that gave a TV, a teaching visuality score. But for the teachers, their mathematical visuality, when they were doing the items on my test, and what they were doing in the classroom were only weakly correlated. Spearman's row, 0 0.404. And this actually made sense, because a good teacher knows what the students need, and even if they don't need it themselves, they will do what they think the students are needing. 
But here are my groups of teachers, and there were some very unexpected results here. There was a non-visual group of teachers, and you can see in black their teaching visuality scores were 2, 3, 4, 3. You will notice all these are color names. They were synonyms, um, sorry, pseudonyms to protect the identities of the teachers. I asked them what their favorite colors were, except that some of the men had their colors were used up already. <laughs> so I had Mr. Gray and Mr. Brown and Mr. Black. <laughs> but most of them, it was their favorite color. And there were five teachers who were doing many, many visual things, nine out of 12 or 10 out of 12 in their classrooms. Mr. Red, Mrs. Gold, and so on. You can see them there. The black are the teaching visuality. In the red, I've also put their mathematical visuality, just so that you can see how different some of them are. Look at Mr. Blue in the middle. He's in my middle group. He used seven of the 12 items for teaching visuality. But on the, the test for preference, he had a three out of 36. He was extremely non-visual in his problem solving. And yet he was teaching quite visually. And that was characteristic of the teachers in the middle group. So, uh, quickly to go through this, in these interviews, it turned out that there were five different types of visual imagery that my visualizers were using. And, you know, it would be so different today. This was in the day before computers were common. In fact, I remember in 1980, Seymour Papert gave his plenary at ICMI number four in Berkeley, California, in which he was going to change the world with the computers. It was just beginning in 1980. And in, when I was doing my research here in 1982-83, computers were not common yet, and I typed my dissertation on a typewriter. <laughs> so you can see. But nevertheless, the depth of understanding of these visualizers came from the qualitative research, not from the statistics. And these were the different types of visualization that they were using. What you would expect, concrete pictures, kinesthetic imagery involving physical movement. A student would walk vectors head to tail with fingers body movement, haptic. Now, the dynamic imagery was not very common. In all these interviews, there were only two cases, but it was powerful. The image itself moved. A student would slide a parallelogram into a, a rectangle or something like this. And this, I think, would be much more common now using the computers. But then there were also memory images of formulae, formulas. A formula itself has a spatial uh, shape. You can imagine the quadratic formula, minus b plus minus square root. The students are visualizing, oh yes, there's a square root, and it helps them to remember. Imagery, especially if it's vivid, has mnemonic advantages. You remember well what you have a good image of. But finally, there was a kind of image which I called pattern imagery. And this was not a picture of a concrete object. This was pure relationships, stripped of the concrete details. And just to give a, a brief example, the best example I can think of comes from chess masters. There was work by the psychologist De Groot in the Netherlands, but also by Binet long ago, looking at the difference between how novices looked at the chessboard and how chess masters looked at the chessboard. And I think you can already imagine the novices were seeing the board in all its concrete details. Oh, yes, the queen's got a little chip out of her head. And 
seeing the pieces as individuals. The masters were not seeing it like that. They described the board as lines of force. They could see the moves, and the whole board was composed of a structure, a pattern. It did not matter what the pieces looked like. That was immaterial. And this was what I called pattern imagery. It was much more abstract, it was generalized, and it was powerful. And all the students amongst my 54 visualizers who did well in mathematics in their school leaving exams used this kind of imagery. But it was not only the pattern imagery that enabled them to do well. There was one other way that they could get rid of some of the disadvantages of imagery, and that was by using a concrete image in a metaphoric way. So, unlike some of the, the books by Lakoff and Nunez, where mathematics comes from, where they talk about different kinds of canonic metaphors, I was interested in the, the metaphors that my students made of their own accord, these visualizers. For instance, one of my students called Alison was doing trigonometry, and she had to work with an angle in the second quadrant. And she said, oh yes, it's a ship sailing. I said, a ship sailing? And she says, yes, can sail this way. Can't sail like this, really. And she realized in the second quadrant she had to deal with 180 degrees, not the 90 degrees. So I said, oh, did your teacher tell you that? No, I just thought of it. So it was her metaphor for a principle. And later there were many, many others. So I have a whole collection of metaphors that were idiosyncratic. The students made them up. Later I worked with a teacher in Chicago, and she used some of the metaphors of the students in her teaching and they became classroom metaphors. And that was another experience, but that's a whole other talk. <laughs> uh, so, limitations of visual thinking. And there were many. Many of the visualizers were not doing well at mathematics. The concreteness of their thoughts were tying them to a prototype. There was inflexible thinking. Oh, in calculus, I had a doctoral student who did this in great detail, a wonderful dissertation. He had an, one of his interviewees was thinking of a parabola, and in his mind, he had the idea that a parabola had an asymptote, and he could not get rid of this idea that there was an asymptote here, and the parabola would not go on forever, it was bound by this asymptote. And this was an uncontrollable image that stopped him from being able to do the problem. Also vague imagery. All imagery has to be coupled with rigorous, logical, analytical thought, if it is going to be efficient. And then the strengths. Well, there are also many strengths. As I've said already, if imagery is vivid, you will remember it. In the literature, there are tremendous examples of people who had a, an image of a happening at, at a point in their lives that became absolutely indelible in their minds. They would never forget it. This image now became the symbol of something that had happened in their lives. But also in mathematics, if you have a vivid image, you will remember it. And then, as I've said, if it's alternating with non-visual logic, it's effective. I wish that I had had access to some of the wonderful computer dynamic imagery in those days, but certainly it was very effective when students spontaneously did move their imagery. And I've already spoken about metaphoric use and pattern imagery. So, where, where would you expect? Let me go back. I will ask you this first. 
With which group of teachers would you expect visualizers to do the best? The visual group, yes? This is what I expected. Would you expect them to do well with non-visual teachers? No. Well, um, the, the non-visual teachers, the visualizers memorized without understanding. They hated it. They had this inner need for visual thinking, and they were trying to memorize to ha satisfy the teacher, and they were failing. In fact, it was some students like that that got me into this research in my own classroom. Students who wanted to become uh, architects, structural engineers, three boys in particular, they were with a visual teacher, and they were failing mathematics. They would not be allowed to do those visual careers. And anyway, the, uh, the unexpected thing was that it was not only the non-visual group, but it was teachers who were in the the visual group also, that were not maximal for these visualizers. The teachers who were in the visual group were doing very many visual things, but they did not know that there were problems with visualization. It was not a problem for them, and the visualizers in their classes were also not doing well. Where were the visualizers doing best? in the middle group of teachers' classrooms. Why? Because all the problems dealt in one way or another with generalization, abstraction, structure. A concrete image can tie thought to that one case, and the teachers in the middle group were also stressing generalization, and they were helping the visualizers to overcome the problems. So this was unexpected. Well, I haven't got time to go into the next part in detail, but I, mine was one of the very first detailed studies in the 1980s, and since then it has become a mainstream category at most of the PME meetings. And uh, I... In the handbook, 1976 to 2006, PME research, I wrote a chapter on visualization, and in that chapter I put forward 13 research questions. And these, uh, yeah, these are still very current, many of them. And I don't have time to talk in too much detail, but just let's glance at these. What aspects of the pedagogy are significant in promoting the strengths and obviating the difficulties? And the, uh, the little blue rhomb rhombus marks that you see mean that in some of the studies, particularly in this um, Z ZDM one, in which Dor also had a chapter on visualization, some of the Papers in this issue of ZDM indicated that teachers needed to know more about that. And where you see the little blue square turned sideways, you can uh, see that that came from that issue of ZDM, that the teachers needed to know more about that. What aspects of classroom cultures promote the active use? Tom, Tommy um, Dreyfus and Ted Eisenberg said, students are reluctant to visualize in mathematics. Are students reluctant to visualize? Some students can't help it. They have to visualize. But they will not tell you that if the culture of the, the teaching and the classroom is not appreciating visualization. So you can't say students are reluctant to visualize in general. My test shows that there are, in fact, four aspects. 
the task itself, the instructions to do the task in a certain way. Third thing, individual differences. And fourth, which I will add, the first three come from Pavio, 1971, individual differences. But the, the fourth one that I would add is the culture of the classroom. So what aspects are useful? Uh, are different types of imagery, that's the third one. Gestures, which I'm very happy became almost a mainstream topic these days with embodied cognition and all the work that is being done and is still advancing. Conversion, you know, Duval's work, going between, moving flexibly amongst various mathematical registers. And here, especially with my work later, in the 2000s in Chicago, the phenomenon of compartmentalization was very, very prominent in my work with students learning trigonometry. Metaphors, I could talk for hours on that one. How can teachers help learners to make the connections between the visual and the symbolic inscriptions? The eighth one I love, how can teachers help learners to make connections between idiosyncratic visual imagery, their own metaphors and images, and the conventional mathematical processes and notations? Reification of mathematical objects. How does the use of imagery facilitate or hinder this one? Ted, I've spoken a little. How can we promote abstraction and generalization in use of imagery? Eleven is important. Very often, emotions are associated with imagery. So affect is something that is a, a topic in, that is relevant in this. And 12, I think I would turn 12 over to door, because <laughs> I, I do not know. Um, I was not able to do this in my research, but I'm very excited at what is happening now in the developments in the computer technology. And I, there are many questions here. I thought in the panel last night that, in fact, we were conflating several questions. There was the question of how the computer technology changes the learning itself. This is one thing. But then there were also the teaching aspects of it. And here, <laughs> Angelica was giving a position that I know was not her position and doing it very well. But there are so many different questions in relation to number 12 and how is visualization important here? And finally, do we need an overarching theory of visualization? Maybe not. Maybe one theory is not going to be useful because there are so many aspects to this. And as the theory is developing, I see exciting new things coming out. But I tried to work on an overarching theory and then realized it depends what you're trying to do with this theory and your research questions are intimately related. There are three more questions. Um, I'll just touch briefly. What about teacher education programs? Can we use more to make teachers aware of these issues in training teachers? Well, I don't want to say training. I want to say in educa education. And... Uh, Yes, the, this is one that is being addressed. But um, what about individual differences? This is a hard question for a teacher, because with individual differences, especially in the use of visual thinking, a teacher may be teaching to a class of 30 students of all sorts of different types of thinking, cognitive styles or a need for visual thinking or need for no visual thinking. And so how can individual differences 
not only how can the teacher become aware of them, but how can the teacher use these differences in teaching in classrooms? And of course, the social aspect comes in here too, now that we are encouraging students to talk to each other in their learning. And of course, close to my heart, how can teachers guide learners to use more effective pattern-based visualization rather than the context-bound one which may hinder their work? Now, I haven't time to go through Krutetsky's problem series, but anybody who wants a very rich store of problems, not only on visualization, uh, you know, he had 27 different series of problems, and all of them are graded, and some of them have information left out, or the students have to find what the problem is for themselves. I used the ones in particular that dealt with his typology of abilities, and that was series 23 to 26. But all of them are important. And in my last few minutes, I want to give you a chance to taste some of his problems. So here's one for you to do. And these all come from his typology series. Maybe you have seen this one before. I also found it in the Moscow puzzles. A train passes a telegraph pole in a quarter of a minute. In three quarters of a minute, it passes completely through a tunnel 540 meters long. What is the train's speed in meters per minute? And what is its length in meters? And I'll give you a few minutes to think about this one. And please, just any way that is comfortable for you. Is it, a, is it clear? You all see the problem? Yeah. Just think your answer and let the others work. Yes, keep, keep your answer. We will check answers in a minute. You can write if you want to. <laughs> it will not change it. It doesn't matter if you write or if you just want to think in your mind. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> so you are all happy? We can go. We can look at the solutions. Well, first tell me, because this is preference. Which of you thought algebraically? Put up your hands. No. I'm surprised. <laughs> because this is one of the ones that some people do algebraically, straight away. It's a distance time problem. Who thought visually? <laughs> All right. Well, maybe because you know I'm interested in visual thinking. But certainly, it is very efficient to think like this. How many of you had some sort of scheme like this? Where you, yes, where you, you had the train entering the tunnel, and then the tunnel, it takes a quarter of a minute to enter, It'll take another half a minute to go through the tunnel and come out. So you can think of a scheme like this. This is a pattern image. And the first segment of the journey is before. Each segment takes the train a quarter minute. So the tunnel is 500 and, sorry, uh, what was it? 540. The tunnel was 540 meters, so therefore it took a half a minute in the tunnel. It will be double that. Is that what you got? 
1,080 meters per minute. And what's the length of the train? Well, the length of the train must be half the tunnel, 270. So the visualization is powerful here. And I said to a, a, a colleague, this was in Portugal where I was giving a talk, some of my teachers wanted to draw the train with the smoke coming out of the stack, entering the tunnel, and they wanted a concrete image. And I said, that wasn't necessary and it wasn't helpful. She said, no, in the computer age, this is very helpful. So she helped me to make a picture of it. On her computer, she couldn't get a picture of the tunnel, but she made a, um, She put the poles on a bridge, and she has the train, and it's all very graphically clear. <laughs> and this is a concrete image, but in my mind, this is still a pattern image because the structure is so clear. <laughs> I think I have time for one more puzzle, do I? One, just one, all right. Let's do this one, also from Krutetsky. A boy walks from home to school in 30 minutes. His brother takes 40 minutes. His brother left five minutes before he did. In how many minutes will he overtake his brother? All right, we have to stop. So uh, let me just show you the... Um, uh, here's a visual solution to this problem. And these were done by actual students. Think of the brother, the, the boy as A and the brother as B. The brother left five minutes earlier. Oh, symmetrical, in the middle, so in 15 minutes. Easy? The visual solution makes it so clear. But it might also be that you use a clock face for this one. The boy leaves, you, you can see the, the details here. Again, it's the symmetry, it's the pattern of it that gives the solution. And I'm going to sum up. We are finishing. Yes, I, I, I've said this already. I've spoken only of Krutetsky. Others have dealt with Vygotsky, Davidov. And taking into account the rich legacy of other res Russian researchers, I look forward to the Russian scholars' further contributions to the international field of research in mathematics education. And this is the sun rising over the Indian Ocean, and it was, it's also a metaphor. It was taken on New Year's morning, five o'clock in the morning. I was in South Africa. It was a new day, a new year, the sun rising over the beautiful ocean. And I'm looking forward to the newness of all your contributions in PME in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Norma. And I guess we will shorter, I mean, we already shorter the break, but let's, let's take a couple of questions. Yes, please. Thank you for your report. I have a question. Um, do you consider abilities of visualization is natural or artificial? Uh, and then what uh, relation? No, yes. Uh, I, I don't, can you still hear me? Yes. I do not think it is necessarily genetic. You know, there are so many uh, 
influences in this question, but certainly the differences in students are clear, that some have this need and some do not. I do not know because I did not investigate where these things come from, but it might be that there are some genetic tendencies that may run in the family, I do not know. But certainly, we need to have a way of taking into account the differences. Um, in, in education, we often find things that students are not strong in and try to help them becoming stronger in their weaknesses. And on the other hand, there's often that people are best at performing when they are able to use their strengths. So we can see that also, I think, in visualization, that some people who are strong in visualization and weaker in other parts, they need help in other parts, or they could be emphasized that they should use their visualization skills. So what's your opinion about this? With people who have either strong or weak visualization, should we work on their strengths or work on their weaknesses or both? <laughs> well, uh, it's a good question. Uh, probably the short answer is both, because it was very apparent that there are students who are very strong in their ability to visualize and they choose not to because they do not need it. So it's not that I feel that it is something that we have to teach them to do because it's good and it'll help them all. Maybe it will not. If they are very happy thinking non-visually and using analytic, logical methods, then that's okay, they will cope with the mathematical learning without the pictures. But some students have to have the pictures. I do not know why, but it is a case. I'm just looking right at this paper. Norma, thanks so very much for a very inspiring talk. You. Um, you said at some point that teachers should be aware that some of the children are thinking in these particular ways, in the visual ways, and it could be that many are, or maybe all, I don't know. But if we think of uh, transition, bridging from theory to practice, what would be your suggestions for uh, teaching practices that would accommodate those types of thinking in maybe in the classroom discourse, yes. making space for for those kind of epistemic practices? Yes. I, I can speak to that because I did a wonderful uh, research project in Chicago with well, my doctoral student, Susan Brown. And she was the head of the mathematics department at a big school, a high school in Chicago. And uh, she gave me permission to come and interview students in her classes and then to work with her in her teaching. And what Susan did, well, I, I interviewed her students for a whole school year and discovered that many of them were using wonderful metaphors for this trigonometry. There was a bow tie metaphor or a boom crane metaphor. And the students themselves had made up these metaphors but Susan took them into her teaching, and then it became a, a, class, a classroom byword. Think of the bow tie, kids, you know, and they knew immediately what she was talking about. So uh, she became aware of these individual differences and how the students were using metaphors and pattern imagery. And she was able to use that as part of her classroom culture. So I think it is possible for a teacher, but it's very time-consuming, and this is the difficulty. She had me as a researcher doing the interviewing on, in the background while she was doing the teaching, whereas usually a teacher does not have that collaboration. <laughs> yes. But definitely, the more teachers are aware of it, I think the more effective they can handle, effectively they can handle the overcoming of the difficulties. Thank you. Okay. 
Uh, what do you think about combining methods? For example, solving each problem in different ways. This is what we're trying. But some people can tell that this confusing students. So what do you think about solving the problem in algebraic and visual ways at the same time? Yes. In the same lesson? Yes. Yes, I think it's very helpful because if students especially are talking in small groups and seeing how others are thinking, it helps them to break the stereotype, the prototypical image. For instance, think of a triangle. Think of a right-angled triangle. Here's a stereotype, a prototype. Oh, this is an isosceles triangle. Okay, yes. So it's impossible to have an a right-angled isosceles triangle. The right angle has got to be there. <laughs> you cannot have a right-angled isosceles triangle. You see what I mean? The prototype can limit the thinking. And if students see how others are thinking about it, oh, the right angle could be up there, then uh, it breaks the stereotype, the prototype, and helps the generalization. Thank you. Thank you, Norma.